So, uh, so if you look at these are the various stages of drug discovery process, drug design and development. So identification of disease, identification of drug target, so establishing the testing procedure like um, biochemical assays, cell line assays, finding lead molecule through that, uh, then doing the structure activity relationship. So while doing the structure activity relationship, it is very essential to uh, identify the pharmacophore, right? So let me define what is meant by pharmacophore. So pharmacophore is uh, the atoms or group of atoms which are commonly present in the active drug-like molecules that contribute for the biological activity. Okay, before that, so far whatever methods we have discussed like um, X-ray crystallography for structural determination, uh, molecular docking, de novo ligand design. So all this comes under structure-based drug design. Okay, so this is the first uh, ligand-based drug designing we are seeing. That is pharmacophore, right? Again, I define what is meant by pharmacophore. Atom or group of atoms which are commonly present in all the active molecules. If you remember, the main difference between structure-based drug designing and ligand-based drug designing is that in case of ligand-based drug designing, so not necessary, we should know the 3D structure of the drug target. So we need set of ligand molecules with known biological activity. So for example, these are the set of known ligand molecules, uh, set of ligand molecules with known biological activity. Say for example, these are the molecules which inhibits COX or these are the molecules, yeah, which inhibits COX, okay, cyclooxygenase. But we do not know, assume that we do not know what is the 3D structure of the drug target. That is not, that is not actually needed for uh, ligand based drug designing, right? Since all this molecule, set of molecules, which, which inhibit cyclooxygenase, reduces the fever or reduces the pain, whatever it is, right? So uh, if you compare this lead molecule, all the lead molecules, if you compare the structure of all the lead molecules which act on COX to reduce the pain, so there will be some feature that is common, right? And that feature, if that feature contribute for the biological activity of that molecule, then that is what is called as the pharmacophore. Again, one last time I repeat, what is pharmacophore? Atom or group of atoms commonly present in all the active ligand molecule acting on same target and responsible for the biological activity of those molecules. That is uh, the form of food, right? So in simple words, we can say that this pharmacophore elements, uh, they basically define the important group involved in binding. So we know that uh, the functional group which are participating in binding, uh, they are related to the biological activity. Okay, so uh, we say that as uh, the active, uh, you know, the functional groups which are interacting with the active site of the protein molecule or which are important for the binding of the drug molecule to the uh, binding pocket of the protein molecule. Uh, so there is a connection between the binding and the biological activity. Uh, so another thing is that pharmacophore is not just finding out which atom or group of atom is important for the biological activity. What is the spatial relationship between those binding atom? That also we study the relative position of the binding group. Okay, that also we explore in the uh, analysis of pharmacophore and um, let me start with the 2D pharmacophore analysis, slowly we will move to the 3D one, right? Uh, 3D is the advanced, more, more reliable one comparing to the 2D pharmacophore. Was, you know, but simple, uh, you know, we had to start with the 2D pharmacophore just for understanding the concept of the 3D pharmacophore, right? So what is this 2D pharmacophore? It defines the minimum skeleton which connects the important binding group, right? So I'm going to give some example, right? So if you take this, the morphine, structure of morphine. So I hope that you know what is the biological activity of morphine. It's a very strong painkiller. Even today, uh, it is in use, very strong painkiller. So it has analgesic activity. 
also uh, some narcotic effects related to this morphine so it means that there are different biological activity for that so if we take this uh, analgesic activity uh, pain killing activity of this morphine so the structure of morphine right so we know that this this structure is actually a complex structure an interesting thing is that uh, this molecule is uh, derived from uh, some natural uh, uh, source So if you look at what are the various functional groups which are present, so here we have uh, NME, uh, there is a, a phenolic OH group, another uh, OH group, aromatic OH group, there is an ether here, and uh, so here we have uh, aromatic ring system, so here we have another ring system, here we have another ring system, here we have another ring system, right? So these are the various component, functional groups of this morphine. So so we know that this is a structure of morphine so it is having very good pain killing activity so whether the entire molecule is responsible for its pain killing activity or some of the functional group which are present in this uh, morphine is that responsible for biological activity if you do any kind of study right so that is what is actually called as the uh, pharmacophore analysis right so i'm going to show another version of morphine Right, so uh, here are some groups which are highlighted in yellow color, right? So those are the important groups for its analgesic activity. Again, I repeat, morphine is having different activity. Narcotic activity is also activity exhibited by morphine. So if we think of analgesic activity, so the groups which are highlighted here as the red color, the OH group here, uh, the benzene ring here, and the nitrogen here, so those are the groups which are important for uh, its uh, analgesic activity, right? So if we make a connection between only the most important functional group responsible for the analgesic activity, right? So then that part, okay, along with that connection is what is called as the 2D pharmacophore of the morphine. So we can say this is the 2D pharmacophore of opioid right so which is having the analgesic activity so this skeleton is what is called as so three important groups essential for its activity oh phenyl group nitrogen and the connectivity here right so it dictate how the three important functional groups are connected so this probably we can say a 2d pharmacophore of the morphine so far is it understandable Yes, sir. Yeah, so moving further. So here we have uh, other derivatives of morphine. So if you look at the structure of morphine and uh, metazokine, so we can see that there is some uh, structural uh, similarity. Okay, so if you, if you similarly, if you look at the morphine and uh, levor uh, phenol, so there is a structural similarity. So in the previous slide, I have shown that uh, which functional group is important and the skeleton of uh, the important functional group so if you remember this okay if you check whether the same group at the same position is present in the derivatives of morphine okay probably we can say that definitely morphine is having that same group here it goes in this way and if you take uh, metazokine it, it also goes here uh, with the same kind of connection here Okay, so here if you take uh, liver phenol, that also has the same skeleton. The skeleton is there, right? So which dictate that all the three derivatives, all the two derivatives of morphine, morphine and its two derivative, metazokine and liver phenol, so they have the same form of feature. Do you agree? at the same position. Do you agree? Yes, sir. So the three form of four element is the one, two, and three at the same position. Okay, so we can see here at the same position, we have the same uh, same three functional group, right? So it dictates that the form of four is preserved in metazokine and liver phenol. So then uh, we can expect to some extent that uh, the property of morphine 
uh, could be probably you know exhibited by metazokine and uh, liver phenol based on the same form of a feature that is exhibited present in metazokine and liver phenol so that is the basics of pharmacophore. I hope that is understandable, right? So here you can see the yellow color, sorry, red color highlighted uh, pharmacophore element along with the uh, skeleton, the uh, the functional groups joined together through the yellow color line, right? So that is the 2D pharmacophore. Whatever so far I have explained as an example for 2D pharmacophore. Moving on further, right? So our, we are interested on 3D pharmacophore because that is the advanced thing. So this 3D pharmacophore, it defines the relative position in space of important binding group. Uh, here, skeleton is shown, uh, but you know, it is not in three dimensional fashion, right? So it's a 2D fashion. So actually what we are seeing here is the 2D representation of all the molecules, not the 3D representation, right? So it's not uh, on the 3D space, right? So for considering 2D pharmacophore, the 2D relationship is fine. Okay, no issues. It, it will give very good, uh, clear visual inspection whether the same pharmacophore is exhibited or not, right? But what we are interested, right? So whether that position is retained at the same uh, three-dimensional space or not, that is very for uh, having the very similar biological activity by the derivatives. So that is what we normally study in the 3D pharmacophore, right? So it defines the relative position, whether the pharmacophore elements are present in the same three-dimensional space, whether the interacting binding groups of the drug molecule, which are crucial, are present in the same position in the three-dimensional space or not. Right? That is what we normally study. Um, so here, this is the 2D representation. So here, this is a 3D representation of the same molecule. Still, we are viewing the molecule in two-dimensional space, but you can see now the complexity of the molecule is known. In 3D space, it is known. It's highly complex, right? So what we study in 3D pharmacophore is that whether the important functional group, what we discussed as this OH, uh, this uh, phenyl ring, and this uh, N, okay, whether they 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 uh, they present in the same position in the three dimensional space or not that is what we normally study so here this phenyl ring and here we have the oxygen atom and here we have the nitrogen okay so we can uh, we can produce the xyz coordinate uh, for this uh, molecule and uh, we came to know what is the xyz position for this what is the xyz position for this ar what is the xyz position for this n and we can compare that with the derivative of morphine, whether whether uh, the the same oxygen it, at the same uh, uh, atomic coordinate, uh, whether the aromatic ring is present at the same atomic coordinate and the nitrogen is in, is it present the same atomic coordinate either using the X Y Z uh, matrix or uh, uh, Z matrix. Right. So mostly we prefer to go with the X Y Z matrix. So here, you know, uh, we have uh, drawn. Uh, the dotted line, uh, which makes connection between the oxygen, aromatic ring, and the nitrogen. So now if we uh, hide the molecule for simplicity, you know, uh, we can clearly see that there is a spatial uh, relationship between the oxygen, uh, AR, nitrogen. So these are called as the pharmacophore element. We map the pharmacophore element. So pharmacophore element is the atom that is important for the biological activity. So here we trapped the spatial relationship. In terms of distance, we can measure what is the distance between the oxygen to AR, AR to nitrogen, nitrogen to oxygen, any combination we can measure. Similarly, there exists uh, angle, right? So since it is in 3D space, so since we have three components, O, A, R, N, so there exists uh, uh, angle. Uh, there is an angle exhibited between the three uh, atoms, three points, which are given here, 18.5 degree, 150, and uh, 11.3. Right. So we can say that this is the 3D pharmacophore of morphine. This is the 3D pharmacophore of morphine. So if any other molecule has the same oxygen atom at this position, uh, same aromatic ring at this position, and the same nitrogen at this position, with the same spatial relationship, in the sense that 
the distance between o to ar is 2.798 ar to ns 4.534 and o to ns 7.098 and the angle between them is 18.5 15. Point, sorry 150 and 11.3 then we can say that uh, both the molecules say morphine and the another molecule x they share the same form of feature at the same position three dimensional position so probably uh, uh, it is better to look into the biological activity of this molecule x okay there are more chances that the x may have the similar property biological activity like the morphine that is the basic idea of the pharmacophore analysis so for uh, any doubt No, okay so moving further uh, since no doubt uh, so what are the so uh, so far our understanding is that uh, the pharmacophore element what we say important for the biological activity is in, in terms of uh, how much important that that functional group is in forming some bond bond with some of the amino acids in the binding pocket i hope i am not confusing you okay pharmacophore element is the group that is important for the biological activity so when we can claim a, a functional group is important for the biological activity right so we have to remove one by one okay if the compound is having five six functional group we have to remove one by one uh, so if we if we take morphine again as example so first we have to remove the oh group okay so and we have to check what is the biological activity whether the molecule is having analgesic activity or not if the analgesic activity is still there after removing the oh which means that that oh is not important on the other hand after removing this oh if the analgesic activity is gone or reduced that indicates that the oh group is important so in this way the medicinal chemist will start uh, removing the functional group one by one uh, to find out that which functional groups are important right so once if they identified which functional group is important for the biological activity those functional group identified functional group should have some binding role to the binding pocket of the protein molecule okay so computationally how we deal with uh, this pharmacophore analysis uh, computationally we look for some kind of uh, uh, some kind of interaction okay functional group that can participate in some kind of uh, interaction so what are the interactions that we are uh, we normally study uh, in uh, computational pharmacophore analysis like uh, always uh, we look for the hydrogen bonding acceptor hydrogen bonding donor uh, van der waals interaction site ionic interaction site these are uh, the interaction sites that we can map right so again i go back to this right so here we have oh group so this oxygen is here highlighted as a pharmacophore element right which means that uh, there is a hydrogen bond uh, acceptor here there is a aromatic group here uh, there is a ionic bond formation group here right so all this functional group can be related to some interaction hydrogen bonding or ionic or aromatic interaction so basically we are interested on uh, you know hydrogen bond donor acceptor van der waals interaction ionic interaction so these are commonly you know uh, studied interaction in the pharmacophore analysis so this is what is for 3d pharmacophore uh, analysis in the previous slide itself i have labeled so here either we have hydrogen bond acceptor or donor so here we have the oxygen atom uh, here we have the hydrogen so either this oxygen can act as a hydrogen bond uh, acceptor or it can also act as hydrogen bond donor right so van der waals and ionic bonding nitrogen can act as a uh, Uh, ionic interaction or it can also participate in hydrogen bonding interaction both are possible right this is what actually we map okay this is what exactly we map in case of the pharmacophore analysis right so what is critical in doing the pharmacophore analysis so very critical component in doing any pharmacophore analysis is finding the active conformation of the molecule right because you know uh, if you think this as a pure uh, ligand based drug design so we do not have 3d structure of the drug target okay we do not have 3d structure of the drug target we know only the structure of the ligand molecule 
if i if i give the scenario like if we have the scenario like we have we have set of ligand molecules with known biological activity so how will you find the active conformation of that each molecule can be present in different conformation how will you find out which conformation is the active conformation so active conformation is the one which can bind to the drug target to produce the biological response okay how will you find which conformation is the active conformation that is going to be the very challenging part for uh, 3d pharmacopher analysis but there are a lot of algorithms which are now uh, available okay so the complexity comes you know uh, i think some images are not visible uh, because i think i kept white i had to change right so no issues right so i'll explain the concept clearly uh, say this is the pharmacophore from target binding site okay so we can uh, if you remember right in the previous lecture we discussed about de novo ligand design so i discussed about how the ludi algorithm work right so functioning of uh, the basics of ludi algorithm so in case of ludi algorithm what actually happens you know uh, it takes the protein ligand complex structure as the input it map the interaction site okay so we can easily map the interaction site so interaction site of the receptor and the interacting atoms of the ligand molecule right so which means that the pharmacophore feature can be ma mapped even for the binding site so this image shows that the pharmacophore feature is mapped for the binding site of the protein molecule so there is a uh, so what is this amino acid aspartic acid sir Are you sure, yeah. You only answer, right? Yes, sir. How many joined? I cannot see. Actually, in, I am in full screen. How many students joined? Five, sir. Very good. Hmm. Okay. If you see this negative charge, right? So you should not call it as. aspartic acid it should be called as coo minus cooh is different from coo minus what is the coo minus should be called as aspartate not aspartic acid right so here we have the serine here we have the phenylalanine right so these are the three binding regions of uh, the binding site and uh, so these are the pharmacophore feature which are needed in the uh, ligand molecule to complement with the pharmacophore feature of the target binding site since here we have a hydrogen bond donor so this can act as hydrogen bond donor and acceptor right so here we need a donor or acceptor so here we need aromatic center for uh, making uh, aromatic interaction so here we have a basic or positive center because you know uh, the the binding pocket form for feature is having some uh, negative charge aspartate right so based on this right so conceptually it's very similar right so what i explained for uh, de novo ligand design so so this is the form for feature of the target site this is the form for feature of the target site uh, nothing new nothing special same thing what i explained for the de novo ligand design right so so this is the 3d relationship that is mapped this, this we can say that form four of the target binding site so the ligand molecule should complement that form four site so form four triangle these are very old concept right so i skip uh, because the atoms are not visible right okay so here comes the uh, real topic uh, what we are interested is what are the various steps how to do this pharmacophore analysis so i don't know how many of you attended uh, uh, the scrodinger workshop right so those who attended the scrodinger workshop uh, you already may have good idea about what is pharmacophore analysis what is 3d pharmacophore analysis and how to do the 3d pharmacophore analysis because there are very few software which can be used for pharmacophore analysis and scrodinger they have one uh, commercial software uh, called face right so if you get opportunity you can use it for your project also right so face is the module that is uh, commercial 
package of Scrodinger can be used for, for, for analysis, right? So my talk is not going to be specific on any software like Ludi or UCSF doc. So this is going to be very generalized, right? So the steps are very common for all the form for analysis software, right? So how many steps basically we have for doing form for analysis? We have four steps of doing form for analysis. So we're going to see what are the four steps and uh, what will be the final output uh, from the form for analysis, right? The very first step is data collection, right? So what is meant by data collection? Say, for example, you are interested on uh, uh, designing a new inhibitor for cyclooxygenase COX. So repeatedly, I'm using this COX as an example because we, we have seen the detailed molecular mechanism of action of uh, drugs which are acting on COX. Okay, COX, prostaglandin, how that is related to pain killing activity, right? So that's why I'm using this, uh, this example again and again, right? So protein again and again. So if we consider, we are interested on designing new inhibitor for COX, more potential inhibitor of COX, novel inhibitor of COX, whatever it is, right? So let us assume, assume, right? So not in real, let us assume that we do not know what is the 3D structure of the drug target. But we, we know what is the 3D structure, assume that we do not know what is the 3D structure of the cyclooxygenase. Right? But we know set of ligand molecules that inhibits the COX. So these are the set of ligand molecules through the biological assays. I came to know that these are the molecules which perfectly inhibits the cyclooxygenase at say nanomolar, uh, micromolar concentration. Very good activity for the lead molecules, right? So our intention is that we had to improvise the biological activity. You had to find some other molecule having better biological activity, right? So in any way we can we can use this form for analysis. First thing is we had identified what is the form for element common feature that is present all the known inhibitor that inhibit cyclooxygenase which are having good activity at nanomolar to millimolar concentration right so we either you can do this experimentally or we can collect this information from the literature there may be already a lot of literature in which they have they have uh, they have shared the information uh, uh, research detail about the known inhibitor of cyclooxygenase and what is the biological activity. Okay, most bioinformaticians will start from the literature review, uh, capturing from the literature. They won't do the experiment, right? So they do the computational part, not the wet lab uh, analysis. But if you are skilled in wet lab, if you have money for funding for uh, the project, you can go for finding set of, take set of lead molecules find which, which compounds are inhibiting COX, find out what is the biological activity of those, right? So now what we know is, we know set of lead molecules that inhibits cyclooxygenase. We know what is the structure of those molecules and what is the biological activity of those molecule. We are no, no way related, concerned about the 3D structure of the drug target. This is what we have. Okay, this piece of information you can very easily collect from the literature. There may be many literature in which they have given series of derivatives of some 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 drug-like molecules with known biological activity of some target. So we had to collect this information from the literature. So that's the first step. Collect set of high affinity ligand molecule for target receptor. Right? So we had to collect the high affinity ligand molecule. So while choosing the data set, while choosing the data set. We have to follow certain uh, uh, conditions or uh, we have to give importance for certain things called, called as concentration. Okay, so what are the concentration? The first concentration is that the molecule should have diverse structural frame, framework. While choosing the data set, either from the literature or from your own laboratory, it ensure that the molecules are having high structural diversity. You may have a question that why the molecule should have high structural diversity because our intention is finding out that which feature is important for the biological activity computationally we're not going to do any structure activity relationship practically right computationally without any wet lab we had identified if all the molecules looks very similar then the algorithm will understand that all the features are important for the biological activity if all the molecules has the same biological activity, but if they are structurally diverse, 
then it will be easy for the algorithm to pick up that which feature is important for the biological activity. That is why the molecules should have diverse structural framework. So second thing is that they should have less torsional degrees of freedom. So probably I have some example in the upcoming slide. So the reason as of now is that if the molecule has less torsional degrees of freedom, so this torsional degrees of freedom I discussed while discussing about the docking algorithm, if you remember. So there are basically uh, six degrees of freedom, three for translation and three for rotation, right? So and many for the torsional degree of freedom. So torsional degree of freedom is nothing but the rotational bond, the number of rotational bonds. Okay, depending upon the number of rotation, rota rotational bond, the number of conformation will, be, will, will increase, it can reach exponential, right? So if the molecule has many number of rotatable bond, the torsional degrees of freedom will be more. So to avoid that, we are ensure that the data set what we are choosing or having less torsional degrees of freedom. So, and as we just do the data collection from the literature, okay, we have to ensure that the data that we collect is of high quality. There are many ways by which we can find the biological activity of uh, the drug-like molecule, uh, starting from very simple assays to very complex assay. Some assays will give very accurate uh, uh, binding result, activity result. So for example, a radio ligand binding assay. A yeah, set of experiment which comes under radio ligand binding assay. So these are the assays which will prove that the molecule what what is in your data set it's actually binding to the cox. Okay, so we label the ligand molecule with some tag. So we we finally measure whether uh, we finally ensure whether the drug molecule bind to the target or not using that uh, that label using fl fluorescence uh, emission of fluorescence or any method right so radio ligand labeling is one of the very high quality assay so we ensure that the data we collect used any of uh, this kind of radio label like lig uh, ligand assay uh, preferably from the same laboratory this is you know uh, whenever we do the data collection right so preferably if you take from the same uh, laboratory then uh, it, it has added advantage okay uh, reason is that uh, if you take uh, one data from uh, Indian scientist, another one from another country, right? So the experimental procedure uh, may change, uh, the pressure, temperature may change. That may have some influence on uh, the binding assay data. So in order to avoid that, uh, we should prefer from the uh, same laboratory. Those are the constraints. Uh, I think images are completely missing in this. Oh, so far, any question? Any question so far? Yeah, sure. Let me check another version of the presentation. OK, I think the some problem with the image. Better I go with this version, right? Yeah. So here, this is what we discussed so far, right? Uh, some issue with the previous presentation. I just go with this. So this is a, a data set, right? So here, uh, if I ask a question whether the structures given in this image, they are structurally diverse or not. So they're not diverse. Right? So we should not choose the data set like this. The reason is that, uh, you know, the algorithm will get confused. All the structure looks very similar, right? 
So if you ask the algorithm that which functional group is important, common, present in all the uh, uh, molecules, then the algorithm may end up like, you know, it, it will tell that uh, all the functional groups which are present are important for the biological activity. So the structure should be slightly diverse in nature, right? So that's the first point we have to keep in mind. A second point, what I said is uh, torsional degrees of freedom. So while choosing the molecule, we had to ensure that the molecule is having some kind of rigidity. It's not completely flexible. So example for rigid molecule is the codine. Even if you take morphine, right? So that is example for uh, for a rigid molecule, right? So codine is another uh, analog of morphine. So here normally you will be having OH in morphine. Uh, the hydrogen is replaced by methyl. That's the only difference between uh, morphine and codine. So this molecule is rigid in nature because the number of rotatable bond is rigid. The torsional degrees of freedom is less. But if you take a uh, 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 phenoxidyl, is a, another drug molecule. So this is highly flexible molecule. How do you say it is highly flexible? Because there are more and more number of uh, rotatable bonds which are present. So if any molecule has more number of rotatable bonds, then obviously it can it can be present in uh, many conformation, right? So the molecule is highly flexible. So if the molecule is highly flexible, then it will be very difficult for, for you to align the molecule. Uh, that's the next step what we are going to do, right? So during the alignment process, it's going to uh, give some problem. Uh, you may not have very good, uh, uh, very good software uh, for aligning the molecule to find out the bioactive conformation. But that is one reason that uh, why we should uh, prefer to go with the uh, slightly rigid molecule than the flexible molecule. That is about the first step. So coming to the second step, right? The first step, we just collected set of ligand molecules with known biological activity with certain consideration. So what's the second step? For all the molecules in the data set, in the second step, we have to do the exhaustive conformational analysis. We have to do exhaustive conformational analysis. So you may have a question, what is this exhaustive conformational analysis? I hope that BTEC students, at least you know what is meant by conformational analysis, right? So if we take this molecule as an example, so this is uh, ethane, right? just for the MSc students. I don't know whether any MSc students joined or not. So anyway, um, so if you take this molecule as an example, so here, uh, so I label this one, first carbon, second carbon, third carbon, first, second, and third carbon. So th this has a carbon-carbon single bond, which is a rotatable bond. So if we rotate, the position of this three atom will get changed. The position will get changed. Two will come to first position. First will go to the third position and so on. Right? So we can generate n number of confirmation. Okay. So the number of confirmation depends on uh, the degree of rotation. Okay. Depending upon the degree of rotation, I can generate n number of confirmation. That is what is called as the conformational analysis, right? So what is the exhaustive conformational analysis? So if you perform complete conformational analysis for this molecule with all possible angle of rotation, okay, all possible angle of rotation should be given. If you do such conformational analysis, that is what is called as the exhaustive conformational analysis. So if we take another example as methane, ethane, propane, so CH3, CH2, CH3. So now the number of rotatable bond increased. In the previous case, we had only one number of rotatable bond. In this case, we have two number of rotatable bond. So we can rotate with respect to this bond and with respect to this bond, we can rotate simultaneously. Okay, so if you generate all possible confirmation with all possible rotational angle of degree of uh, angle of degree, then that is what is called as the exhaustive conformational analysis. So we have to do this exhaustive conformational analysis for all the compounds in the data set. So for example, in the first step, you have selected 15, 25 compounds as the data set. For all the 25 molecules, we have to do the exhaustive conformational analysis. So if you do the exhaustive conformational analysis, all possible conformation of the 25 molecules will be identified with the corresponding energy. So why do we do this conformational analysis? Because each conformation of the molecule will have certain energy. Okay, all the conformations will not have same. 
So you might uh, heard about all those terms. I'm not going in deep. Uh, skew confirmation, eclipse confirmation, staggered confirmation. Okay, these are some terms you might heard, right? So different confirmation of the molecule is associated with a different energy. So once if you do the exhaustive confirmation analysis, all possible confirmation and the corresponding energy can be identified. So for any question. Any questions so far? No, sir. OK. So moving on further. First step is we, we collected the data set with some concentration. For all the components in the data set, we performed the exhaustive confirmation analysis. So we know all possible confirmation and the corresponding energy in the second step. That's what I explained so far, right? Uh, some images for you to understand the concept clearly, right? So a person, different position. We, if you assume this as the molecule in the data set, we can say that the, the same drug molecule, the drug, the lead molecule in the data set, any one lead molecule is present in different conformation. So this person is present in different conformation. So each conformation is associated with different energy. So the person is lying here, the person is standing here person is sitting here, right? So the person is, you know, upside down here, different conformation, right? Each conformation is associated with different energy. So while lying, he's having low energy. While sitting, also he's having low energy. While standing, also he's having low energy. While present in this conformation, right? So upside down with one, one uh, hand, he's having very high energy. So this is another high energy state, right? So it will be difficult for the person to be present in this state for a long time. This is medium energy. For some period of time, he can be present in this confirmation. He can also be present in this confirmation for some time. Another confirmation, he can present long for long time, low energy, right? So which means that each, each confirmation of the same molecule is associated with different energy. So we completed the exhaustive confirmation analysis. And we have to identify that which conformations are low energy conformation. So in this, this is a low energy conformation. This is a low energy conformation. Uh, this is another low energy conformation. This is another low energy conformation. So these are the conformations we are interested on. We are not interested on the uh, medium energy or the high energy conformation. The reason for picking the low energy conformation in step two through exhaustive conformation analysis is that the bioactive conformation, okay, mostly they used to be any of this low energy conformation. Again, I repeat, why do we discard this medium energy and the high energy conformation? Most of the cases, the bioactive conformation of the drug molecule. The bioactive conformation is the conformation in which the drug molecule can bind to the target to produce the desired biological response. That conformation most of the time used to be used to be any of this low energy confirmation is that understandable yes sir yeah. going further we are in step three literally speaking step three is the last step of pharmacophore analysis but we normally used to say that there are four steps right so let me finish step three and you can understand uh, why this is the last step of pharmacophore analysis while going to step four, you will understand that uh, why that step is optional and how important is that step, right? So what is the third step? Third step is the computationally very expensive step. Okay, so this is a place where, you know, uh, uh, the companies are tricky in writing the algorithm. So what we normally do is that we take uh, the data set. Okay, uh, end of second step, we have, we have, uh, the data set compound and for each compound for each compound we have various confirmation all possible confirmation and out of that we picked which confirmations are low energy confirmation so that is what we have for this compound one like that we have for 
all other compounds this is for the second compound so this is for the third compound like that whatever is the number of compounds in the data set all those will have the low energy conformations there is no one compound right one compound now different many conformations are representing the re representing one compound these are many conformations of the first molecule different conformations low energy conformation of second different low energy conformations of third third and so on right so what we had to do is that we had to do the molecular superimposition again molecular superimposition is not new concept for you right so we discussed what is molecular superimposition while discussing about the chirality the importance of stereochemistry in drug design and we discussed non superimposable mirror image that time i told you how to superimpose right so you cannot you cannot superimpose the uh, left and right hand okay that is what you have to simple example for understanding what is super, in that way you have to superimpose one molecule over the another molecule right so we have to take all the low energy conformation of all the molecules in the data set and we have to perform this molecular superimposition okay so uh, why do we do this molecular superimposition so this is the principle used for finding the bioactive conformation so once if you complete step 3 will tell you which conformation is the bioactive conformation this is actual question which i asked you right so how will you find out the bioactive conformation since we do not know what is the 3d structure of the drug target okay so we rely on uh, the computational methods for finding out the bioactive conformation that is identified uh, through the molecular superimposition right so let me give one example uh, you will clearly understand what is molecular superimposition how uh, we do that so here we have three molecules say molecule number 8 13 and 22 so those are the three molecules three different molecules in the data set okay so these are three different molecules of the data set so this is molecule 8 uh, i write here this is molecule 8 and this is molecule 13 and this is molecule 22 so like that you may have many number of molecules just for example we are taking three molecules from the data set for explanation right we had actually do for all the molecules right so this eight will be present in different conformation say all are low energy conformation these are the low energy conformation of the molecule 13 so these are the low energy conformation of molecule 22 and so on so say this is one molecule one conformation of molecule 8 this is one conformation of molecule 13 and this is one conformation of molecule 22 hope now that is clear right so one one conformation of molecule 8 13 and 22 so if we look at this by simple visual we can say that there are some functional group which are commonly present in all the molecules so definitely we can say that this nh2 group is commonly present in all the molecules 8 13 22 right so maybe in all other uh, molecules also just for example three molecules we are taken so this cooh group is present all the molecules and this uh, benzene with phenyl ring is present all the molecules do you agree three groups which are commonly present somebody can respond yes sir okay so now uh, if you try to superimpose this molecule keeping one molecule over another right so what will happen that perfectly we can align uh, this group with this this group with this do you agree just move the molecule and keep this group over this keep this over this all all the benzene with f will be superimposed right Yes, sir. So, if you do so, will this group get superimposed or not? Will it get superimposed or not? No, sir. No, 
that is right okay because we are thinking to solve this problem in through two dimensional way right so we had to think this to solve in three dimensional way right anyway what your answer is right i do go with no okay we cannot superimpose so what actually does is that uh, the algorithm will identify that which functional group is commonly present in all the molecules given in the data set again i repeat which functional group is commonly present in all the molecules in the data set secondly it will try to superimpose each conformation of the molecule in all possible uh, ways the first conformation of this superimposed with first of this superimposed with first of this superimposed with first of this first of this first of so first of this molecule superimposed with the second of this second of this second of this and so on so in all possible conformation we have to superimpose all the molecules okay so in which combination in which combination most of the functional groups are superimposed three dimensionally and that conformation is assumed as the bioactive conformation maybe slightly confusing for you just look at this image in the bottom you can easily understand so this is the phenyl ring with f okay so the phenyl ring with f is present here in all the three molecules so this uh, cooh group uh, this uh, nh2 group is superimposed here all the three compounds and the cooh is superimposed all the three compounds here so do you agree that all the three functional groups are superimposed yes sir okay so now the conformation in which most of the functional group superimposed like this that conformation is what is called as the bioactive conformation is that understandable that is what is called as the bioactive conformation so now we can say that this conformation is the bioactive conformation of this data set is that understandable yes sir so how do we say that because that is the conformation in which most of the functional groups are you know superimposed right so now we can say that these are the pharmacophore elements 1 2 1 3 and there is a special relationship between the pharmacophore element okay that is what we actually studied in the 3d pharmacophore